I'm a scientist. I was trained to define a specific problem, make a hypothesis, and then generate data that either supports or disproves it. While in theory, this process should allow us to answer questions both small and large, in practice, I found that when I did this work alone, I typically only asked questions where I could already see a clear path to the answer. But for many of the most important questions that we have to ask in the world, we've tried the clear path. It doesn't always work. When I started to think about working on a big problem like malaria, I heard words like crazy, insane, intractable, and plenty of other phrases that I won't share with you today. And rightfully so. Malaria kills half a million people each year and debilitates a quarter of a billion, mainly pregnant women and children. It compresses the economies of nations. This is not only because so many people die of the disease, but because others are too sick to get the education that they both need and deserve. Over time, I started to think that working on a problem like malaria, a big global social justice problem, thought to be intractable, thought to be crazy, required that we ask different questions. I wondered if working with people from a diverse range of backgrounds would allow us to ask questions that we dare not ask by ourselves. Well, it's a nice idea. But if we're really considering the unexpected, if we're really throwing ourselves open to all possibilities, where do we start? When do we stop considering and start actually doing? Believe it or not, reality can actually help us here. The reality of the problem creates constraints. And as engineers will tell us, constraints can be key to problem solving. While some might see constraints as hurdles, roadblocks to getting the job done, if they're applied correctly, constraints can be the origin of creative and innovative solutions. Let me give you a couple of examples. First, there are technical constraints. The malaria parasite is transmitted to humans by mosquito bite. We can't grow the form of the parasite that infects us in the lab without mosquitoes. So doing malaria research means growing tens of thousands of mosquitoes, essentially as little malaria production factories. We then hand dissect the salivary glands to isolate the parasite. After some practice, it's not quite as hard as it sounds. It's also not exactly easy. It makes studying malaria tough. After hours of dissection, we can isolate millions of parasites. Unfortunately, what's typically considered a good starting point is billions. That means that after we dissect and dissect and dissect and dissect, we still don't have enough material to do even a conventional experiment. Next, there are economic constraints of working on malaria. There are drugs that you and I take when we travel to malaria endemic areas. But these drugs are only effective for a few years before drug resistance emerges, and we need a new drug. But it takes 10 years, $2 billion, to make a drug from scratch. And the average person who gets malaria lives on only $2 a day. You don't have to be an economist to see the writing on the wall. The numbers just don't add up. There's just not much economic incentive to make new anti-malarial drugs. Now, these technical and economic constraints could have caused us to throw up our hands. But instead, they forced us to look broadly for a solution. A solution based on these constraints started with what might sound a bit like a Rube Goldberg device a 1990s-style dot matrix printer that we use to print malaria parasites. 
Perhaps some of you have fond memories of your first printer at home. It made a funny sound as the printhead moved back and forth, essentially stamping ink on the page. We do something similar, but instead of printing ink, we print malaria parasites in teeny, teeny droplets. Each droplet then becomes the site of an experiment. Because the droplets are so small, they don't require much material, and we can do thousands of experiments on a single microscope slide. This workaround allows us to ask bigger, broader questions, leaving open the possibility that we'll come up with unexpected results. These experiments are greater than any single experiment we would do in isolation. What we came up with was something we never would have considered had we not first used our printer to miniaturize our experiments. That malaria parasites bear a striking resemblance to another disease that's much better studied, cancer. Now, I'll be honest, the day that we made this discovery was a very exciting day in the lab. But before we could fully celebrate, we realized we didn't really know what to do with these data. This is where the economic constraints came in. Because there's really not much of a budget to make new anti-malarial drugs from scratch, we decided to consider the possibility that drugs that had already been developed for other diseases might be effective against malaria. But how do we know what drugs to use? Fortunately, computer scientists and mathematicians have a wide variety of tools at their disposal that aim to take data and turn it into predictions. So we reached out to our colleagues and asked a simple question. Given all the data we had collected, what drugs might be effective against malaria, and what drugs aren't worth a shot, given the limited resources we have at our disposal? By working with computer scientists, we were able to identify specific drugs that had already been developed against cancer and might be effective against malaria. What's more is that these drugs have already been found to be safe in people, but in some cases, they're not very effective against cancer, so they're just sitting on a shelf. But against malaria, these drugs can prevent some laboratory mice from ever getting sick after they've been exposed to the infection. What's even more exciting is the way that these drugs work. They don't target the parasite directly, and instead, they change the environment that the parasite needs in order to thrive. One example of this is drugs that target a family of proteins called tumor suppressors. Just as the name suggests, when there are high levels of these proteins, they suppress tumors, meaning no cancer. What we found was that these proteins are not just tumor suppressors. They're malaria suppressors as well. What this means is that drugs that were originally developed to suppress tumors can also make our bodies into better malaria-fighting machines. And since these drugs don't target the parasite directly, there's almost no chance that the parasite will develop resistance to the, the drugs. Not only could this approach bring old drugs back to life, it might make them effective for longer. We're even starting to ask if it could, these drugs could be effective against other infections as well. In this case, it was a combination of working with computer scientists, the appropriation of an unusually engineered instrument, and the economic constraints placed on us by working on malaria that led to the real breakthrough. By working together with unpredictable allies, we were able to carve out a path forward in the fight against malaria. We never could have done it alone. Now, I'm a scientist through and through. Everybody who knows me will tell you that I absolutely love it. But I can't help but think that one of the most important things I do as a scientist is to incorporate and truly, truly appreciate the insights that come from other disciplines. The most important problems that we have to face together, now and in the years to come, 
simply are interdisciplinary. I actually spent my early 20s working in political activism jobs. When I started graduate school, I thought I was giving up my passion for social justice in order to become a scientist. I had no idea how intertwined the two pursuits would become. The insights that we've gained from computer science, engineering, and biology, along with the constraints placed on us by economics and the very real political realities of the world, are greater than anything we could do alone. The infections that shape our lives, our communities, and our world are willing to do anything and everything in order to keep spreading around the globe. We too, then, must be willing to take advantage of anything and everything in order to eradicate them from the face of the earth. To do this, we must work together. Thanks. <laughs>